Our study now brings us to 1 John chapter 2, where we'll look at verses 28 all the way through chapter 3, verse 3. You remember the theme of the book of 1 John. He's doing two things. Number one is he's addressing the false teaching that seemed to be prevalent and attacking the faith of his audience. A false teaching that had at least two major components. Number one is the belief that you could really practice sin and it not affect your relationship to God. In their minds, somehow, they had twisted the idea of flesh and spirit to where what you practiced in the flesh did not affect who you were and the relationships you sustained in the spirit. Second component was is that since flesh and spirit are so distinct and separate that God could not come in the flesh. In other words, Jesus was not the Christ. He shows that both of these components of this doctrine are false. But another thing that we see in 1 John is that this false teaching seemed to be threatening and undermining the confidence of these Christians. And so while attacking the false doctrine, John is also bolstering and encouraging these Christians and reassuring them that they have the knowledge of God, that they have a relationship with God and a fellowship with Him. See, let's see how this section of 1 John attaches itself to those themes. 1 John 2, verse 28 says, And now, little children, abide in Him. John uses that language a lot in 1 John, the idea of abiding in Him. This concept started all the way back in chapter 1 when he talked about walking in the light as He is in the light and having fellowship with God. Abide in Him. Abide means the idea of living or dwelling, staying in Him, staying in a fellowship relationship with Him, but also, as he's going to go on to say, abiding in Him in the sense of your conduct abiding in Him. Now, one question that arises in this section is, who is Him? Abide in Him. He had said earlier in chapter 1, verse 24, that you'll abide in the Son and in the Father. And then he went on to say in verse 27 that they had an anointing which you've received from him that abides in you. And that anointing may have been the Holy Spirit. And so he's talked about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit abiding in them and them abiding in both the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so it could be that John has in mind really what we would call the Godhead, abiding in him, abiding in God in its most broadest or generic sense. But also the possibility is that since he's talked about abiding in the Son and in the Father and saying as he did in chapter one verse or chapter two, verse twenty three, Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father also, but he who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. That fellowship with God, the Father, is possible only through fellowship and relationship with Jesus, the Son. And so in that sense, he may be talking about abiding in Christ, And now, little children, abide in him that when he appears, again, that leads us to believe, we talk about he appears and at his coming, that this is talking about Jesus Christ, abiding in him, which again gives us access to abide in the Father. 
Now, little children, abide in him that when he appears, again, this is talking about his second coming, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. This confidence seems to be what he wants to reassure these Christians about. Don't let these false teachers undermine your faith and the confidence that you have of your relationship in God through Jesus Christ. So you abide in Jesus. You do not reject Jesus as the Christ so that you may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Imagine believing this false doctrine and believing that Jesus was not the Christ, the Son of God. How will you feel when he comes again in judgment? Having rejected him and having believed this fanciful doctrine that says he was not the Son of God, you'd be ashamed, wouldn't you? So if you know that he is righteous, again, the he here is speaking about him at his coming, Jesus Christ, you know that he is righteous. You know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And so again, the emphasis is upon our practice, our actions, that we cannot walk in darkness. We cannot practice sin and have fellowship with God. We have to practice righteousness. Now, a point about this is the idea of practicing righteousness is, is the idea of a lifestyle. That's the language, again, of chapter 1, walking in light, walking in darkness. I'm not talking about the occasional good deed or even the occasional bad deed, but it's one who chooses to have a life of righteousness. And if we choose to have a life of righteousness, that is evidence, our confidence of our relationship with him, that we are born of him. He introduces this concept of, of the birth relationship, of being born in him. Remember in John's gospel, he records a man by the name of Nicodemus coming to Jesus and Jesus telling him that he must be born again. And he explains to Nicodemus that that's not a physical birth, but a spiritual birth. And that's the spiritual birth that John is talking about here. We are born of him. But we are God's children. And that theme continues in chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father. So we've been born of him. And so... He deserves the title of Father. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. Again, He is our Father. We are His children because we've been born of Him. Now, there's two implications, at least, of that concept of being born of the Father and being his children. The first implication is love. What manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. This phrase, this concept should evoke wonder and marvel at the idea that God would choose us to be his children. That he would choose to be called our Father and choose to call us children of His. That God would want a relationship with us and would call us by His gospel so that we might be born of Him. What a wonderful, glorious thought that we can be children of God. And we're children of God because He's called us that. Now, therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. This is an idea that he's going to continue in chapter 4. 
the world does not know us. Know here in the sense of, of understand us. Grasp why we're doing what we're doing. Have you experienced that? Do you have worldly friends that just can't understand why you're living the Christian life? Why you're abstaining from the passing pleasures of sin? Well, they don't understand because they don't understand him or they don't know him. Verse 2, beloved, now we are children of God. We are the children of God. He is our Father. And he emphasizes that that is now. You, regardless of what these false teachers may have you believing, you are now children of God. You now have this relationship with him. If, again, chapter 1, if you're walking in the light, as he is in the light, you have fellowship with one another. You have fellowship with God. You are his children now. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. So now, maybe the point here is now in the flesh, you are children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. And again, maybe the idea of when we will just be spiritual beings. And so it's possible, regardless of what these false teachers are saying, it's possible to be children of God and have a relationship with Him while we're in the flesh. We are now children of God. There'll be a time in which we won't be in the flesh, but just be spiritual beings in heaven. And he says it's not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall, at his coming, when he appears, be like him, for we shall see him as he is. This fully spirit relationship and existence doesn't exist now, but it shall exist when he comes and when he appears. And we will be like him because we are born of him. He is our father and we are his children. So the first aspect of this father-child relationship is the love the love that's been bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God. But another aspect or implication of this father-child relationship is found in verse 3. And everyone who has this hope, the hope that we shall see him at his second coming and be like him, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. If we are the children of God, we're like him. And we will purify ourselves as he is pure. A child looks like its father. We use that illustration sometimes, as sometimes children do resemble their parents. They may have a similar nose or eyes or other features that say you look like your father. But even in the most broadest sense, I'm a human being because my father was a human being. If my father was a fish, I'd be a fish. If my father was a bird, I'd be a bird. But I am who I am because of who my father is. And the same is true spiritually. I'm made in the image of God. And when I become his child in a deeper sense, in a spiritual sense, then I will resemble my father as well. We shall be like him, and we shall be like him now. 
I will purify myself because he is pure. I walk in the light as he is in the light. But if I'm not pure as he is pure, then he is not my father and I am not his child. And so if I have him as my father, I have love and I'll have purity because I will be like my father. You see, it's not possible to sin, practice unrighteousness and have fellowship with him and to be his child. If I'm truly to be a child of God and experience this great love, then I will purify myself as he is pure or I'll walk in the light as he is in the light.